Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this week's discussion and update on COVID-19 webinar. I am Kathy Purdy, Marketing Manager at Bond. Two quick housekeeping items before we get started. Please enter your questions through the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen, and we will do our best to answer those as time allows. Uh, your comments and suggestions for future topics are important to our attorneys, and we would appreciate you taking a moment to complete the brief survey once the webinar has concluded. So to start this week's presentation, I'm gonna pass it over to Pete Jones. Thank you, Kathy, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's good to be back here with you uh, for our Tuesday webinar. We've got a lot to talk about today. Um, so uh, let's kick it off with uh, Jeff Shear. Jeff's a, a member in our Syracuse office, um, and Jeff's gonna provide a, an update on relief programs um, and some year-end planning considerations. Jeff, take it away. Great, thanks, Pete. And it's uh, good to be back with the uh, with the group, and uh, we'll get right into it. So there isn't a ton to update on the uh, the paycheck programs or the Main Street lending program right now, but I'll I'll give a couple. I know you, there have some been some updates the uh, the past few weeks on uh, on these topics. So um, one is we're hearing on the forgiveness application for the PPP. We're hearing more and more banks are starting to accept applications. Um, so I think a lot of uh, lend borrowers are, are putting applications in. Um, our recommendation uh, has always been, maybe you don't wanna be the first, you don't wanna be the last. Um, a lot of lenders are using third-party administrators um, and these third-party administrators may have already reviewed a lot before even the bank uh, opens up their doors uh, for the application. So even if you get it in early, you may not be the first one. So um, I think it's a great inquiry to your bank to see uh, if they're accepting applications, if they're using a third party administrator and uh, when you should start getting those applications in. Um, in the past, we've reviewed the timing on the forgiveness applications. Banks have 60 days to review. The SBA has another 90, uh, still holds true. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later in our conversation today. Um, one of the items I did want to, uh, to highlight on the forgiveness application is the uh, FTE reduction safe harbor number one, which is your um, safe harbor for the inability to operate between February 15th and the end of your covered period at the same level of business activity due to uh, compliance with federal, uh, state, or local authorities. Um, we've been hearing that there's a very broad interpretation of this safe harbor. Um, it's really an all or nothing safe harbor. There's a box to check on the forgiveness application if you're relying on this. And if in fact you check that box that you're not at the same level of business activity, um, you have no uh, reduction to your FTE. There's no uh, FTE reduction quotient that's applicable to your forgiveness amount. So I think it's something really to, uh, to look at when uh, putting your application together. I know previously we put together a list of executive orders in New York that, have, uh, that, that you can rely on for this exemption. So I think it's really something really important to consider as you're putting this together. Um, with respect to the Main Street Lending Program, not much to update there. Dollars are still available. I heard a story in NPR uh, earlier this week that there's a lot of money still available um, from that program. If you have any interest, um, there is a webinar tomorrow, October 21, that the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston is putting on uh, with information about the Main Street Lending Program. And it's something that I really think uh, you should look at if, you're, if you, you have some additional needs. Um, as much as you may be hearing, we really don't expect any major updates from Congress this week or next. Uh, they're focused on some other things right now. Um, next, I wanted to get into some highlights for some year-end tax planning opportunities. Um, number one is I strongly encourage you to meet with your accounting firm or your tax advisor now. It's October. There's still opportunities in November and December to take some action uh, under the CARES Act that you may benefit from. Um, meeting now as opposed to December is going to give you time to take those actions. Um, one of the things I wanted to highlight was the opportunity uh, to carry back uh, net operating losses. So under the CARES Act, many of you may know, it resurrected a provision that allows businesses to use current losses against past income. There's a really tremendous opportunity here if people have losses this year. Um, NOLs arising in tax years of 18, 19, or 20 um, can actually be carried back five years for refunds against prior years. So uh, basically what the rule is, it's been resurrected, 
is that losses in this year can offset income at higher tax rates that were in place before 2018. So the reason I'm bringing this one up in particular now that it's October is that there may be opportunities to either accelerate deductions in this year, um, maybe make some um, uh, uh, purchase some equipment, um, create expenses that'll create deductions and possibly losses in this year that you can carry back to future year when there was a higher tax rate. Um, so that's why I wanted to bring it up now as you talk to your tax advisors, see if there's this opportunity, see if you actually do have cash uh, to make some purchases or create some deductions that you can then carry back to a year where there was a higher tax rate. I think there's a really tremendous opportunity there. Um, one of the things that's kind of a catch-22 is that some of you may be taking advantage of the deferral of payroll taxes. If you remember, you cannot pay ta deferral, you cannot pay, ta pay um, payroll taxes this year, pay half in 21 and half in 2022. Um, you're not getting the deduction this year for the payroll taxes. Um, if you have the opportunity to create losses this year by paying those payroll taxes, that may offset the desire to push those expenses off into future years. So I think that's a, a really good reason to examine some of these opportunities. One of the other things that I really wanted to point out is the um, above the line charitable deduction. This is something that I've been talking to a lot of my not-for-profit uh, clients about, uh, some boards that I sit on. Um, here is the opportunity that individuals can deduct charitable contributions in excess of $300 in addition to their standard deduction. So if you remember a couple of years ago, the uh, federal government increased the standard deduction uh, for all taxpayers. Um, and that really eliminated the necessity for some taxpayers to itemize their deductions. Um, and there was a concern by a lot of not-for-profit clients and a lot of exempt clients who rely on charitable contributions that it will um, really uh, discourage people from giving uh, contributions that they do it merely for the tax benefit. Well, this year, in addition to your standard deduction, any contribution in excess of $300 um, is going to be deductible. So I think if you have um, donors who usually give, I don't know, anywhere in excess of $200, $200 or $250, I think they really should be encouraged to bump that contribution up to $300 so they can get that deduction in excess of their standard deduction. Um, and it's something that we've been putting on or I've been encouraging a lot of my clients to put on their materials this year, reminding contributors that they can get this extra deduction if they bump up their contribution in excess of $300. Uh, I think it's a real benefit out there uh, in a year when I think monies are needed. Um, the last thing that I, that I wanted to touch on is really the timing of the forgiveness application. And the reason I'm bringing this up is that um, a lot of forgiveness application, a lot of PPP loans and the forgiveness is gonna straddle two tax years. You're straddling 2020 when the paycheck loan is treated as a loan and you're struggling and, and, and that's that's bridging over to 2021 when hopefully you get in, you get forgiveness. And this impacts your expense deductions as we talked about before. Um, any expenses that you pay using PPP loans are not deductible but they're not deductible once you get that forgiveness. Um, it's gonna impact financial reporting because of that. It's gonna impact tax reporting. Um, the other thing that the concern that I've raised with a number of clients are those that are passed through entities, um, partnerships, LLCs, S corporations. Um, if you have changes in equity ownership between 2020 and 2021, the fact that your PPP is treated as a loan in one year then forgiven in another year, with the deductions being taken in the second year versus the first year, you know that's going to create some inequities if you have changes of, owner, of ownership uh, concerning like distributions, allocations of profits and losses. So I think that's another reason really to get together with your accountant and figure out how you're treating your PPP loan in 2020 versus the forgiveness in 2021, and whether um, you know looking at the timing of your uh, your tax return looking at the timing of your owner's tax returns when really figuring out how that's all gonna be treated. Um, and the last thing I wanted to mention was, um, now's a perfect time if you haven't already to review your bank loan covenants. Um, the paycheck protection loan is a loan. It can impact your debt service coverage ratio. It can impact other bank loan covenants. Um, and I don't wanna, you know, it would be awful for people to fail bank loan covenants and end up in a default because of the paycheck loan. Uh, so it's a conversation to have with your banker sooner than later. So those are the highlights I wanted to give today.
Um, any questions, you know how to reach me. It's up on the screen. Uh, and it's great uh, being back on the program and talking to everybody. Jeff, thanks. Um, appreciate that update. A lot of good information there. Um, we're going to turn now to uh, Carrie Lang. And uh, Carrie, when we originally uh, conceived of this week's topic, just two days ago, we were going to be talking about uh, the New York City uh, ordinance primarily, um, which uh, is a development, but um, there also has been some uh, New York State guidance that was issued today. So I think Carrie's going to have a few thoughts on that, preliminary thoughts, since it just came out this morning. Carrie, take it away. Yeah. Hi. Good morning or afternoon, everyone. Um, so the purpose of this um, discussion update this morning was to talk about, like Pete said, the New York City Earn Sick and Safe Time Act, which was amended um, on September 28th. And those amendments went into effect on September 30th. And, you know, it was kind of done a little bit under the radar here. So we wanted to give you some updates because the changes were significant um, if you have employees working in New York City. Um, that said, about an hour ago, we found out that the Department of Labor issued some guidance on the New York State paid sick leave law. So, um, you know, I'll talk about that first. Maybe that's a little bit more exciting for some of you. Um, you know, again, I just skimmed this pretty quickly. Um, a lot of it was, you know, what we expected. A few things that I wanted to point out. Um, what, an interesting development on telecommuting. So the guidance, there are some FAQs that you can find on the Department of Labor website. And one of the FAQs asked about telecommuters. And um, the Department of Labor made it clear that employees who telecommute are covered under the law only for the hours that they're actually working in New York. And that applies as well to employers outside of New York who have employees working in New York. So if you have an employee working in New York, those hours that they're working count toward the accrual under the New York State paid sick leave law. Um, you know, they also said, again, things that we know, but you know, you accrue one hour for every 30 worked up to 40 or 56 hours per year. So even if the employee works more time during the year, the accrual stop at 40 and 56. Um, you don't accrue during non-working time. You know, I think that was clear before, maybe more clear now. So if you're using sick time, you're not also accruing um, hours work toward additional sick time. Bereavement doesn't qualify uh, for paid sick leave. Um, let's see, there's some details about the regular rate of pay, what's included and how to calculate it. So I think that's notable. Um, one thing that I was looking for was some guidance on um, the carryover requirements, because if you remember, the statute was very, um, you know, kind of, it said that employees have to be allowed to carry over all their sick time from year to year, and then it capped the use. It said, you know, however, employers can um, only allow employees to use 40 or 56 hours per year. So it was a little bit unclear, um, you know, can you cap carryover at 40 or 56 hours since that's all an employee can use during the year. And unfortunately, we don't have great guidance there. Um, there is one FAQ that just reiterates what it says in the law that employees should be allowed to carry over time from year to year, even if that results in them having more time than they can possibly use during a given year because you can cap the use. One thing that I did find, there's an FAQ on part-time employees, and it talks about can you use a front-loading method um, for part-time employees, and how does that work? And, you know, the Department of Labor says, yes, you can. You can prorate it. In that discussion, there's a sentence which I found was interesting. It says, an employer who front-loads fewer than 40 hours must allow employees to carry over up to 40 hours of unused sick leave into the next calendar year which sort of presumes that if you know, you're front loading more than 40 or 40, you don't have to allow the carryover, but unfortunately it doesn't go that far. Um, you know, doesn't give me the level of detail I was hoping for. Uh, but again, I only looked at this very quickly before this webinar this morning. I'm sure that we'll be doing future, uh, more in-depth discussions of this guidance. Um, it's fairly lengthy guidance. Um, so, you know, in the meantime, take a look. If you have any specific questions, you know, feel free to reach out. Um, and I just want to turn for a minute now to the New York City paid sick leave law. So the Carrie, purpose is, yes. Real, real quick before you go on. 
So yeah, sure. we're talking about guidance, not regulations, right? We still have not seen regulations. Yes, this is just guidance on the website. Yeah, thanks, Pete. Um, for and then the other thing that I wanted to mention is we, we will be doing a webinar. Everyone should you know stay tuned for that. I think we'll be doing it later this week, um, going into a little greater detail on what Carrie just said um, before we move on now to New York City. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I'm trying to cram this in here. There's a lot to talk about. Um, so New York City, um, the the Earn Safe and Sick Time Act was amended, like I said earlier, when it, the amendments went into effect on September 30th, like the New York state law. Um, the intent of the amendments was, it, it appeared to be to um, align the two, the New York state law and the New York City law. So um, the New York City law only initially applied to employees who work in the city more than 80 hours in a calendar year. And, uh, you know, that was changed with this amendment. Now, employees, you know, they, they don't have to work 80. If you work one hour in the city, um, you're going to start accruing. Um, all of the, um, the limitations. So employers with less than five employees that have a net income of a million or less in the previous year have to provide 40 hours of unpaid New York City earned sick and safe time. Um, if they have less than five employees and a net income of over 1 million, like New York State, they have to provide 40 hours of paid earned sick and safe time. Um, if they have five to 99, again, like New York State, they have to provide 40 hours. Um, and New York, the New York City sick time law was capped at 40 hours, but the amendment has made it so that now if you're an employer um, that has employees working in New York City and you're an employer with 100 or more employees, you have to provide up to 56 hours. Um, of earned sick and safe time, just like New York State. Um, the New York City law previously had a, um, there were, employers could impose a 120 day waiting period. So if you were a new hire, you could um, have a, pol employers could have a policy set that says that, um, you know, employees have to wait 120 days before they can use their time. That has, um, gone away here. So there's no longer a waiting period under New York City's law. Employees can use the leave immediately after it's been accrued. Um, and, and those were, you know, and a couple things to point out there before I move on to the things uh, that New York City, because there were some additional changes. So even though the law was effective on September 30th, a couple of the provisions were phased in. Employers with less than five employees and the net income of a million or more um, those employees can't use their accrued time until January 1, 2021, um, because that's a, new that's a new requirement for the city. So they're giving employers time just like New York State did. Um, and then similarly, employers with 100 or more employees that now have to give employees 56 hours per year, um, they can limit the use of time to 40 hours this year in 2020 the new accrual goes into effect um, in 2021, up to 56 hours. Um, in addition to all the um, changes that were made to align with New York State paid sick leave law, there were some documentation changes to the city's law. So um, the city FAQs make it clear that employers can require reasonable documentation if uh, from a medical provider to support the need for leave if employees are out for three or more consecutive days. And if employers had that as part of their policy, you could require documentation. Uh, the revised law now mandates that if an employer requires documentation, the employer has to reimburse the employee for any costs or fees charged um, to the employee for producing that documentation. So that's a new development. The same principle applies to any, not just medical documentation. So if there's a cost associated with documentation because an employee is using safely, for example, for a domestic violence reason, the employer would have to pay the cost. Um, there are changes to the pay statement. There, there's now a requirement where um, employers have to include on their pay stubs the um, accrual, the amount that employees have accrued and used during the previous pay period and the total balance. Um, this is, again, it's a new requirement. And even though the law took effect on September 30th, the department has posted language on its website saying that it's not going to enforce the pay stub requirement until November 30th. 
as long as employers are attempting to uh, comply in good faith. So employers have a little bit of time there to get things in order. Um, employers now also have to post conspicuously uh, the notice of employee rights. And the, there's going to be a new uh, notice of employee rights, an updated notice issued by the Department of Consumer Affairs. The department has yet to uh, publish that notice, but there will be a new notice. And that notice now has to be posted in a conspicuous place um, in the employer's place of business in an area accessible to employees. Um, and lastly, that updated notice of rights has to be provided to employees at the time of hire. And you always had to provide a notice of rights at the time of hire, but now you have to hand out the updated notice. So for those that are already employed, as of September 30th, the updated notice has to be provided to employees by October 30th. They were given a, we were given a 30 day period to comply. Um, domestic workers now um, are covered under New York City's law. Um, a couple other things that are notable, the retaliation provisions were expanded. Um, the, the definition was broadened, essentially. Um, there are more adverse actions that um, an employer can take uh, that would constitute retaliation. Uh, the department, they're, they're enhanced enforcement provisions. So now the Department of Consumer Affairs on its own initiative can investigate violations. So we don't have to wait for an employee complaint. Um, under the revised law, employers have to respond to complaints from the Department of Consumer Affairs within 14 days. Uh, the old requirement was 30 days. So they pretty much cut in half the amount of time that employers have to respond to a complaint. And then lastly, um, the, uh, there were significant revisions to the ability of the department to grant relief. So now it's not just for the complainant, but for each and every employee or former employee affected by a violation. Um, so I think we can expect to see some um, enhanced enforcement efforts and you know, we want everybody to be prepared for that. We drafted um, a blog article. There's an article up on our blog uh, that you can go to for additional details. Again, I just gave you a quick summary. There, there are many more details in that article. Uh, so feel free to take a look at that if you have a chance. So Carrie, thanks. Um, just, uh, just to be clear for everybody. So you've got the New York State paid sick leave. We got some new guidance today. We'll be giving you an update on that. For, for employers who have employees in New York City, there are some what I'm going to call conforming amendments, um, but they may not be exactly the same. So you're going to have to look at both um, to the extent that you've got employees in New York City. Um, and, um, and we've got um, updates on our website on both. And we'll be doing a, um, a webinar this week to uh, further expand on the New York State uh, guidance. Anything else, Carrie, to, for people to keep in mind before we move on here? No, I think that's all for now. Okay, thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Um, a lot of content there. Okay, we're going to move on now to um, uh, Jen Schwarzow. Jen is in our uh, Rochester office, and she has been following litigation for us, and um, she's got some updates on, you know, CARES Act, uh, a variety of different litigation issues. Jen, take it away. All right, thanks, Pete. Uh, good to be with everybody again in the uh, weekly webinar here. I hope everyone's taking care and doing well. Um, so Pete asked me to cover CARES Act litigation. Uh, there's a couple of important foundational points I wanted to go over first, um, and then we can talk about some specifics. So you may, uh, if you're a litigation nerd like myself or interested in such things, you may have noticed that there aren't thousands and thousands of CARES Act uh, cases out there, civil lawsuits. And uh, you may be wondering why. So I'm gonna tell you why that is. And that is because the statute itself does not have what we call a private right of action. So a private right of action is um, something that allows a private person or company to file a lawsuit for violating a statute. Um, that is something that is not present expressly in the CARES Act. Um, and so that, quite quickly after the, the statute came out, um, a case in the Federal District Court of Maryland 
uh, was initiated by four applicants uh, to Bank of America because they wanted to take advantage of the PPP. And so what that court quickly said is, um, no, you can't do this because the statute doesn't have a private right of action. Um, by a comparison, um, for example, a good one is an environmental statute, right? So there's lower scores of environmental statutes um, that prevent people from polluting. So if I, uh, a company goes and dumps toxins in Lake Ontario, um, I, because I love Lake Ontario, can't sue them because they violated the statute. The government can, um, but I can't do that unless I had, had a, an injury specifically. And so that's essentially what the court said. So that stymied a lot of cases that had been initiated already, um, similar cases, and many of those cases were what we call voluntarily dismissed. So the, the parties gave up and said, you know what, you're right. Um, what has been happening since then is there has been some cases trying to interpret an implied um, right of action. So that's something that isn't expressed in the statute, but the parties say, um, the plaintiffs would have the burden of saying, well, I'm going to take this language of the statute and that language of the statute. And, and we believe Congress did intend to allow us to have a remedy under this statute. Um, several courts have weighed in and said, no, we don't think so here. Some of those cases are on appeal. Um, but the courts that have weighed in on that have said um, they've analogized it to the Small Business Act which is where this CARES Act comes to us from legislatively. And so they've said that, that many court cases have come before us that said um, there is not an implied private right of action for the Small Business Act. And so we don't think there should be one here for the CARES Act either. Um, that does not mean, however, um, that people aren't still trying to be creative and, and bring some suits. But, but that's largely why you haven't seen a lot of independent parties um, filing, for example, in the Bank of America case, um, what they were trying to say is Bank of America had taken the position that the criteria had set forward to whether you could apply for a PPP loan uh, was not fair and not in line with the statute. Um, and the court in that situation said, no, you can't do this by a matter of law. And by the way, um, the language specific for deciding that category is kind of a, they shall consider, but th there are other things they could consider. And so that was not allowed to go forward. Um, but importantly, as I alluded to before, the government does have the ability to uh, pursue claims against violations of the CARES Act. And there's certainly a lot of legal scholars and attorneys out there who think that that is going to happen in the coming months. Um, the particularly uh, with this could be related to the election and, and what, you know, if the Justice Department turns over um, to a different administration and has a different attorney general and, and often will be the direction of where that might go. Um, because the government can prosecute um, folks who violate statutes, government statutes, either both in a criminal context, if they believe there's willful conduct or a civil context. So that might um, come up, for example, they, there is a history, let's say a particular lender that was exercising unfair criteria. Um, let's say they were prioritizing um, using discriminatory practices or only giving to certain types of applicants and not giving to other applicants who would seemingly otherwise qualify as well. If there, that would be a pattern that they could, the government could come in and say, no, um, you've abused, you violated the statute. Now, in that case, the, the people who might have been wronged, let's say the folks that didn't get the money, the government doesn't have a way to give them um, a remedy. However, the company itself can be fined. Um, with a civil penalty. In very extreme cases, criminal charges can be filed. Um, that is not very common and not something um, absent a real intentional willful conduct you would expect to see. Um, but that's something that might be coming uh, on the horizon in the future. Um, the other part that I think that is likely to come up in the horizon is relates to what Jeff was talking about in part, which is the loan forgiveness. Um, everyone will remember from a minute ago, he said that 
um, the loan forgiveness applications are increasing. Um, and so for many, I think there's a, a awareness for some, but maybe not everyone that that is a loan. And so the forgiveness aspect um, isn't a guarantee. And so I think many folks who believe that it was or had that impression um, will maybe have a fight with that. I think because those doc those um, loans were given with documents, loan covenants and contract provisions, there could be a, a disagreement between parties. In that case, the it would kind of be an indirect litigation related to the CARES Act because the litigation itself would be, to, be between the applicant, so someone's asking for forgiveness, and the lender. Um, and that type of litigation from, from a legal perspective would be permitted absent some kind of caveat or waiver that would be included in the relationship, the documents, in other words, that were signed between the applicant and the lender. And so that, that is certainly something um, that might be coming forward as, as these um, loans are starting to become due, particularly if, if you had an expectation that your loan would be forgiven and now it's not, um, and you believe the lender is applying unfair criteria, for example, to um, how they're deciding whose loans are forgiven, who's not, that would be something that might uh, potentially result in a suit, as well as the reality that some of these folks who got the loan just simply can't pay it back because they don't have the cash to do so. Um, and so they're naturally would be in a typical way, um, litigation that can crop out of a situation where you have a debt and it isn't be able to be paid. Um, and so I think that that's probably where, where things are heading. There have been um, some class actions out there just generally related to um, third party fees uh, and paid to folks who've been helping with lender applications, that sort of thing. Most of those have all been squashed. I think class actions, um, when they come out and they're mentioned in the media, get a lot of attention because it seems very serious. But from a, most of those um, aren't going anywhere to uh, a, a, a significant end, if you will. Um, so that's kind of where we are on the horizon. I think it'll be interesting to see going forward um, what's going to happen. Uh, and certainly to the extent you find yourself in a situation where um, you have questions about loan forgiveness, or you feel like you have been treated uh, unfairly, or uh, you know criteria have not been applied, um, that's something that you could reach out to folks here at Bond to assist you with, um, and walk you through the process of of what you can do, and how you can get some help with that. So that's all I have, Pete. I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Jen. Um... We're just trying to keep our eye on everything um, and all the different angles for you. So uh, um, keeping after that um, every week. Um, and speaking of um, some different angles, um, we're going to turn now to Aaron Pierce. Aaron um, uh, wanted to share a few thoughts today on uh, what might be happening, you know, when you're doing furloughs, reductions in force, things of that nature, how that can impact your retirement plans. Um, and uh, some aspects of uh, um, um, your severance plan. So Aaron, go take it away. All right, thanks, Pete. Um, yeah, the retirement plans can certainly be impacted by uh, reductions in force and uh, um, um, furloughs. One of the issues that we wanna make sure clients are paying attention to as the end of the year approaches is a, a, a concept called partial termination. So there is a rule for retirement plans that provides that upon the occurrence of a partial termination, that affected employees have to become fully vested in accounts otherwise subject to a vesting schedule. So if a partial termination is deemed to occur, regardless of an employee's uh, or a terminated employee's years of service, they may become or may be required to become fully vested in their account balance or benefit under a retirement plan. So a partial termination is uh, can occur when there has been a significant reduction in the number of active participants in a retirement plan as a result of of 
employer initiated terminations. So in 2020, obviously a lot of employers have been experiencing unusual turnover. Um, many employers obviously have had to institute furloughs or reductions in forces, which result in terminations of employment turnovers larger than they would have in a typical year. And that could trigger a partial termination. Um, the IRS has issued some limited guidance about how the partial termination rules uh, are, uh, are impacted by COVID-related furloughs and, and reductions in force, and they've confirmed that those types of, of uh, terminations would count towards the determination of whether someone has had a significant decline in the active participant. So even if it's not the employer's fault that they had to shut down and furlough or let go a number of employees, those terminations are still considered to be involuntary terminations of employment and would count towards determining whether a partial termination has occurred. So how do you know whether that's happened? Well, you, you have to uh, calculate what we call a turnover ratio. So you look at the number of employer initiated terminations during the applicable period, and that's generally a plan year. So if you're operating on a calendar plan year, how many in employer initiated terminations did you occur, did you incur in the 2020 plan year? And then you divide that by the total number of participating employers in that in participating employees in that plan year. So I'll give you a simple example. You know, let's say that um, in 2020, we had 250 employees in our plan on January 1, 2020. Maybe we added 15 new employees in the plan. So we had about 265 participating employees in our 401k plan um, in 2020. But we had to let 85 of them go due to a variety of factors. Perhaps it was a uh, COVID-related workforce reduction or, or, or other involuntary terminations. So our turnover ratio is 85 over 265, and that results in a 32% reduction in the number of our active participants participating in the plan over the course of 2020. So under IRS and and court uh, and court rulings, you know the a reduction of active participants in your plan of at least 20% generally is deemed to have resulted in a partial termination. So in this in our scenario, because we had a 32% reduction in the number of active participants in our plan, we've incurred a partial termination. Uh, now, that doesn't always mean uh, that you have to uh, treat it as a partial termination if you are in an industry that typically has very high turnover. Um, so, for example, a 25% turnover right wouldn't be unusual for, for your industry, then that doesn't trigger a partial termination. But if you normally don't have turnover at that rate, and because of uh, employer-initiated uh, terminations during the year, you incur a, uh, a, a turnover ratio of 20% or more, generally is going to be considered a partial termination. Well, what does that mean? Well, what a partial termination requires is that the affected employees, uh, those employees who terminated employment during that period, would become 100% vested in their benefit under the plan, regardless of their years of service. One interesting uh, twist on that is that although we're only looking at involuntary terminations when we're calculating that turnover ratio, once we've made a determination that a partial termination has occurred, all terminated participants in that plan year get the benefit of that full vesting. So that would include voluntary terminations. So if you have a significant reduction in your uh, participants in your plan, triggers full vesting for any participant who terminated during that plan year. So it's something you need to be looking at as we approach the end of the plan year. Generally, that, that determination is based on that full 12-month plan year. So you got to take a look at what kind of uh, turnover you had from January 1, 2020 to December 31st of 2020 if you're operating on a calendar year plan year. Um, certainly, if you brought employees back, so if you let go or had to furlough a significant number of employees in March or April or May, but you were able to bring a number of them back, those would not count as involuntary terminations because they're here at the end of the plan year. But it's something a retirement plan sponsor needs to look at. Um, if you make a determination that you have had a significant reduction in your uh, employees covered by the plan, need to be working with your third party administrator to make sure that we're uh, appropriately implementing uh, uh, full vesting for those affected employees. You may have had participants who left Early in the early in the year, and took a partially vested distribution. And for example, you might have had an employee go out when they were only 50% vested. They needed the money, so they took that 50% vested 
the, the, the vested portion of that account, because of a partial termination, they may, may now be 100% vested in that account. So they may be due a supplemental distribution from the 401k plan. So just keep your eye on it as we go, uh, get towards the end of the year, make sure you're communicating with third party administrator so you don't miss that rule because it can have a significant impact on, on your plan participants. Um, the other thing I wanna mention is a quick plug. We are going to be doing a, an employee benefits uh, a webinar on October 29th uh, at 8.30 to cover kind of a, an employee benefits year in review. Certainly we'll be focusing on a number of COVID-19 related topics, but also some topics unrelated to COVID-19. So if that's something that's of interest to you, uh, the registration information is, is on the website. Thanks, Pete. Thank you, Aaron. Um, a, a trap for the unwary, it seems to me, if we're not uh, uh, just on the lookout for those issues you just uh, spoke to. Okay, I'm going to um, I'm going to go to Katie now. Um, Katie Anderson uh, is in our Albany office. Um, the update from Albany section. I'm going to guess that Katie has been um, looking for real time updates here. So <laughs> take it away. That's correct. Today I need the breaking news icon to show up, but uh, you know, next time, next time I'll work on that. Um, let's start with some non breaking news first, and then we'll get into what everyone wants to know about. Um, first thing, we have this new executive order came out last week. Um, it extends 15 other executive orders. The biggest thing to pay attention to there is schools and localities. Um, if you have a violation of the cluster executive order, uh, this may lead to the withholding of state funds. So that is a big change. One other thing as well, and this was just announced um, by the governor, the commercial eviction moratorium is going to be extended to January 1st of 2021. That will match it up with the residential uh, eviction moratorium. If you want my opinion on that, for what it's worth, this will continue to be extended until, and I say this very broadly, until there is federal relief, um, because otherwise we are facing an enormous eviction crisis, um, unlike anything we've ever seen in this country. Cluster update. The reason I'm including this is I think it's very important to take a look at uh, the fact that, you know, I've, I've discussed this, I, I spoke about these clusters at length and said, if this works, this is what we're going to be doing. Um, it's working, so this is what we're going to be doing. If you look at this, um, you can see that the red clusters, um, you're seeing significant changes in the the positivity rate. So the Rockland County or the Orange County clusters, that's a, those are dramatic drops uh, in clusters and they have ramped up testing in those areas too. So it's not as though fewer people are being tested. So good news, the red zone cluster attack areas, that's working. Biggest news there will be coming tomorrow. Uh, the governor said that they would be uh, discussing and updating what the cluster zones are tomorrow. And as a result of that, I, I decided to look ahead for tomorrow, took this map from the New York Times. The New York Times does a really nice job of laying out where what you're looking at per capita of clusters. Uh, as you can see, the southern tier is in bad shape uh, cluster-wise. Steuben County uh, is that red one. Uh, that one has, it's bad. It's not going well around there. Uh, same thing with Shimon County. Broome County is doing better. Um, you have Shenango County, which borders Broome County, also doing, not doing that well. Uh, Cortland County, you have a cluster that's emerging out of, I believe it's out of SUNY Cortland. Um, but Again, that's all, it's changing rapidly. So I expect that tomorrow you're going to see more uh, cluster activity in the Southern tier because that's really where uh, New York is centered right now on trying to you know, limit what's happening with COVID. You also see Green County uh, is actually orange on this map, but uh, Green County has a cluster as well uh, that is of concern. So this is, I, I bring this up because we're just trying to look ahead to the future, trying to provide you with a little bit of notice about what might be coming your way. Um, this leads us to the breaking news segment of, uh, of today. Uh, the governor was giving a press call to reporters. I, uh, through 
different types of means am able to listen into those press calls uh, that aren't generally available. So I'm happy to be able to do that because I can provide you with updates, even though the, uh, you know, all I do every day is try to figure out what the governor's up to. So <laughs> first thing, let's go to this updated guidance regarding international travel. This was uh, released at this point almost two weeks ago. Um, the state keeps taking this guidance document down from its website, putting it back up, taking it down, putting it back up. I don't know what that means, but it's out there. And it says that the essential worker exemption does not apply to people who are traveling internationally. That's a blanket statement. If you have questions about that, it's just not something I can give general advice about over a webinar. Uh, unfortunately, this is something that's very specific that you will need to get in contact with an attorney if this is impacting you. Um, second up, we see Connecticut yesterday changed the metrics for qualifications to its travel advisory. Connecticut, New Jersey, and New York uh, did the travel advisory together. Uh, Connecticut changed its metrics. Why? Because Connecticut would have qualified for its own travel advisory if it did not. Um, and <laughs> I think Connecticut was hoping that New York would follow suit. New York did not follow suit. Um, that was pretty clear today. Uh, the governor announced that there are now 43 states on the travel advisory. Did he say which states were added? No. Um, that would have made my life a lot easier, but he did not. Um, the states that appear to qualify, and they spoke at length about this, we know that Connecticut and New Jersey have now qualified for the travel advisory. Um, it appears just based on, again, these have not been confirmed yet. Uh, as soon as they're confirmed, you know, I will hustle to get that information out as quickly as I can. Um, it appears that Pennsylvania, another border state, is going to be added. Uh, Maryland looks like it's going to be added, and so does Arizona. Um, that puts us to 43 states and territories. So that leads a lot of questions. That's three border states that are being potentially added, or at least two that are confirmed being added to the list. So what did the governor have to say about that? He said, I'm going to have more to say about that tomorrow. So I guess we're all going to hang tight until tomorrow based on what he was saying during this conference call, non-essential travel. Um, so work, I think it, it appears that any form of work is what they want to try to allow. But other than that, I don't, you know, it, it appears to be that they're going to try to restrict recreational travel. But obviously, this is a very difficult thing to enforce uh, between border states. You know, the main mechanism that New York uses with this travel advisory is to have people in airports fill out this traveler health form. And that's really the main way they, they can use it. But otherwise, it's really easy to jump in your car. You know, you think about any border town in the southern tier, you can throw a softball and you're going to hit Pennsylvania. It's, you know, it's a very difficult thing. And same thing with the borders of New Jersey and Connecticut. That is specifically, you have many people coming into New York City every day. So I expect we're going to see some big changes to the travel advisory. I don't know them yet. Uh, <laughs> and I will let you know as soon as I know um, what they're going to be. So I don't know, Pete, if you if there are any questions that you think that I should answer, I haven't had a chance to look at them, but um, I'm happy to happy to discuss. No, I, I, that's helpful. Um, I, I, I think we're moving back into a phase where, you know, there seems to be more information happening. There was a there was a period of time when the daily news conferences stopped and the updates came less frequently. Um, and unfortunately, it seems we're getting more updates more frequently. Um, including some with unanswered questions, like what we're going to do about the border states. So I would- One other uh, thing too, I wanted to add as well, sorry to interrupt you, but one last thing just before, you know, we don't, you know, to, is, New York is in, compared to every other state in the nation, New York is in a very good place. Uh, when you take a look at infection rates uh, in other states, New York is the fourth lowest, I think the ones before it are Vermont, Maine, and New Hampshire. So those are significantly smaller states. Why that's good news is apparently, you know, these microclusters are working. It helps avoid broad 
business closures. Um, and I know that's, you know, that's a main thing that everybody on this webinar wants to know about. We are looking to avoid a huge shutdown again. And it appears we're chugging along on the right path. Um, that could obviously change. The holidays are coming up. People are going to see each other for the holidays. Um, whether they do that safely or not is really going to impact how we do for the rest of the year. That's it. Okay, Katie, thanks um, and, and stay tuned. Um, we're gonna keep doing this every week and we will also do more frequent updates via um, you know, our blog posts and our newsletters um, and pop-up webinars. So everyone, thanks for uh, staying with us. Thanks for uh, joining us every week and uh, we will talk to you next week. Please stay safe.